Christians coming in lieu of fathers, and um, the question is probably more pious, um, and so why don't you welcome me to the second lecture of the 2019 Emmanuel's Legal Christian Management Speech Series. On behalf of the college, I would like to express our gratitude to the Annenberg Foundation and to trustees, class of 1989 alum, and parents of a current medical student, Kelly Kassan, and Greg Burnett for providing us this opportunity each year to bring distinguished executives and youth group leaders to Claremont to share their valuable knowledge and experiences. So this evening, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Basil Roberts, who is managing partner and founder of the law firm Roberts, Roberts and Roberts, which speci specializes in multifamily entertainment industry clients in television, film, and music. Prior to this, Basil was president Solar Records, one of the most successful African American owned record companies in the West Indies. His early work as a civil rights attorney with Manning and Roberts included representing the NAACP in the Los Angeles Free Dis Desegregation Clinic, Crawford versus Board of Education. I believe that was in the 1970s. Virgil was extremely involved in serving the Los Angeles community, having held a number of leadership positions at various organizations, including serving as chairman of the Los Angeles Education Partnership, chairman of the board of the California Community Foundation, treasurer of Los Angeles Private Industry Council, and vice chairman of the Public Education Fund. He presently serves on the boards of Community Bridge, Claremont Graduate University, Families and Schools, Alliance of Artists and Record Companies, Southern California Public Radio, Auburn Federal Bank, the Big Bang Group, and the Alliance for College Ready Public Schools. And I know they're missing one, but they're happy to see him. I can see because he's so fun. Ten years. The Citizen Community Based Organization. Hundred Black Men of Los Angeles recognized Virgil's contributions with a lifetime achievement award. So I just want to say a couple of words about um, I had never met Virgil before this afternoon, and um, read his book, and um, we have just really, really enjoyed having the chance to talk with each other. Um, I couldn't be more happy to be able to have a second chance to talk with you um, and to see you. So, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming. The, uh, my wife is not here today. I hope she's coming. Um, but it allows me to bring you all up again to talk. My wife is always saying, I think you're going too long. And I'm a lawyer, and um, I want to say the clients think that I'm going to take it too long, so I won't say any more about this book and the, the couple of pages that the book provides. Um, but my, my purpose in, in speaking with you tonight is to talk to you all about leadership, which, which I was doing uh, in my own way. Um, leadership something that we all talk a lot about. We all speculate because we think we're going to be taking it over. We feel like that will be the end of the world. Um, and it's a subject that the professor who said it even writes about. Um, and so I want to tell you about my journey and what I learned from about being a leader and think about leadership as following the development of your own soul. Um, and it comes about in part because of my background. I mentioned my background in Ohio because where you come from has a lot to say about who you are and how you're going to be. Um, and so I come from a place that I know very faith community and very well and have a lot of seven children. And we were really never born as immigrant into our home. Our folks were sharecroppers in East Texas, um, and their day came when the shots fired for them in Clarence Hill Church, and we never had the opportunity to go to school. Our main schoolhouse was in Clarence Hill, um, and I think my mother went to school for me about fifth grade, um, and the most favorite thing that I could get the father to let us or grandma to let us go to school was to let 
in the money. So he said, you tell him that if he wants to go to UCLA, we will pay for it, and we will send him instead of a check. So I'm going to go to UCLA, and at 12 o'clock he's going to bring it to our tennis court. He's got a really nice room. There's a great kitchen. He's going to sit in the kitchen. He's going to have vodka bottles and some liquor bottles. And so I would go to the, the law degree school in UCLA, and because I would go to the law degree school in college, I have three younger brothers, and I helped all of them go to college because I know from the school they had to pull out their financial aid plan and the kinds of things that go for them to go to college. And it started for me a lifelong quest to try to make public education work better for kids like me. For kids who are immigrant kids, who are poor kids, whose family wants the most for them but they don't know how to tell us it's really not the case. So throughout my adult career, I've been involved in the school reform activity. And I graduated from law school, came back to Los Angeles, and I really started to represent the NAACP in the Los Angeles County Fair and Gay Pickers Crossing Gay Bowl organization. Um, after being involved in that case for about three years, and by the time I was still in Los Angeles, the voters of California passed a proposition, Proposition 1. And the effect of Proposition 1 was to do away with all desegregation litigation in California that had been decided by the California Supreme Court. Prop 1 passed, and by, and if you look at the news, by 1983, Los Angeles Police Organization Code, San Diego Code, Pasadena Code, San Francisco Code, all those codes were made retroactive. And then it began a lifelong effort of working with nonprofit organizations to try to reform public education. Um, I've done a number of school reform efforts in the Los Angeles area as well, and I've been involved in all of them. Um, and most recently, over the last, I think the last 14 years now, I was assigned as an organizer of a, of a public school organization called the Alliance for Positive Public Schools. We go to schools in Madison County, Maryland, and Vallejo. And we have schools in Watts and Pickering Road and Hampton Park and West LA. And because we're small, great schools, that system didn't drop off. So when we started building charter schools, the parts of LA where we have uh, mostly black and brown schools to instead of urban schools, the dropout rate exceeded 50% for high school. Um, we started building schools where the um, average student coming to a high school is only about four to six years old. Um, for the middle schools that we have, the average student comes in only about second grade level. And 100% of those students who are admissions to the Northern Seminary pass the high school exit exam. 95% go to college. 73% go to trade school. We graduated 2,000 kids a year, and the trade schools are exempt from all the grades. Um, they go into college. Kids in Maryland, the kids in Wild River County, and the kids in that case in New York and the kids in Maryland from the Mexican Coast go directly there with the rest of the grades. So, I spent a lot of time trying to, to make those things happen. And so along the way, what I had to do was begin to master the skills that were supposed to be helped to me as a Southern Bureau Chief of Mission. So, so I, I have a lot, of, a lot of aphorisms that I write down, the things that, that I say to people, and I'm going to share some of them with you because they all fit into my notion of the things we have to learn and do to become effective leaders. So, one of the first things that I would have said to my kids, I guess I do know if they're listening, first thing that, that I learned is that a small group of people can create a big change. Um, and we know this in history. We know that when men in the 1600s launched the revolution, people did not listen. But what I learned is that if you get two or three people to have a meeting of mind, and they recognize their gifts, they can do big things. And I've 
已经吃药到了，啊，好像到五十二岁的时候，我就推着他，就是我就跟他说，对不起，我想要再问一下，那算了，我吃了好像医生说，我们可以去吃消炎药，我也可以吃什么样的治疗药，什么药都可以吃，但是我不认识。这个不认识的药店，跟我们说，就是我们这个五十二岁，就是这个发的话，跟那个跟我们这个师傅，跟就是说，就是他的他的师傅说，啊，就是因为我们我我不是说送礼物，因为我不需要你像发现，啊，我说我不知道怎么去跟他借钱，因为怎么样找找这个老太，就是那个他们一个人，因为。在我这个家里，或者可以送我，不需要你们的话，我我说我我不会送。我说我要是我就是说我需要饭就送饭，但是我要跟他看一看。啊，他，你你就只回答一个看看医生吗 ？OK， this should be the way you would answer as you would actually contact the person, somebody from your department or whatever. You would come across the wire, and you would be contacted by them. So CIA officers, with a with a rank of maybe one or two, they would come into the room. So there would be reports literally from every country in Europe and all the CIA officers. And our 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 job is to go and just sit and decide how we are going to help the person that we have a good deal with. Um, I learned things about. Foreign policy. I learned things about Iran. I, I started working with Iran at the University of Rock Carson at the time. That's one thing. But in 1967, there were 107 air strikes in Iran. Uh, in July, I think it was the fourth or the eighth. I think it was the fourth. And there was a sense that America was doing that there was some harm to the Americans that was going to be done. And I decided that I had to play a role working with some of the Americans rather than just going in and throwing thirty shots at some representative of ours. So I went back to UCLA and I said, "We need to have a black study schedule." And I was with Jansen and one of the defense faculty was over there, and I said, "There is no such thing as black education. There is no such thing as black study." And so I got together with two other students. We decided what we would do is we would create a black study program, and what we did is the first program we had to get over was the question of whether or not there was some kind of affirmative suppression of the black experience that was not true. So we had the ability at UCLA to create a program of courses, and I created a program of course uh, that we called the Black Man and the Fate of American Consciousness. Then what I did is I invited people of multiple disciplines to come in and give a speech. So I had sent out to London and Liverpool and to the Vatican to come in and talk about psychology from the black perspective. I had Tim Ford Drake from the Economist come in and talk about economics and its impact on the black community from a black perspective. I had historians come in and talk about what was going on. In Black America, from a Black perspective, and so we, I started with the general idea of that course to convince the university that it made sense to have a Black Studies program with its English term that we were talking about, and I said we had a section to recruit with a different perspective.、Uh, so it didn't take all the Black students on campus, it didn't take all the white students on campus, it did not take. Administrations of any, any of those things. We just took coming up with an idea for how we wanted to change what people thought, and we just took it on that idea. And my thought was that a small group of people who are committed to doing something can make a difference with this group. I often say, you know, I want to avoid you know the fact that people think that you know that. The most important thing you can have as a black student is money. You can afford it. What is it going to buy you? Because you have to give people hope. You have to show them that you care, and you have to give them a message. Now, when I 
the coast where I was in uh, junior high school. That's where I had friends who did that too. And uh, I was learning the hurdle. And so one of the things he, he taught me was, you know, I think it was a man right there on the left. And he said, focus on the center field. And that way put anything you want just to stay in the hip. If you start looking at the hurdle, you're going to knock the ball down and you're going to lose your feet. So I always believe that when you're going to be a leader, when you're going to try to conquer something or rise to the bait, the right kind of competition, you have to have an idea of what the audience is and the goals of the team. And then the hurdle are the things that stand in your way as you, as you try to achieve that goal. You just have to stay committed and focus on the goal. Then you'll get it. And the hurdles are not cause you to stumble. You learn to race, if you will. You're winning the race and you stay focused on that goal and you stay focused. Um, leaders lead by example. You never ask somebody you're looking at a leader to do something that you would be doing. Uh, I was president of a significant company for a number of years. And one of the things that I learned in order to get people inspired by our work is we talked to them as all about work. I said, listen, work that needs to be done is done by the way of work. It is your collective mechanism of you to yell out loud to the team. Do you agree with that? When you can yell out, when you see uh, you have your release, one of the things that we would do is we would send out albums to all of the DJs in the country in the place that we call the record store, and we'd send records, we'd send records to the dealers. So we had a list of maybe five to ten people that would go to concerts and events, and they would come and send out a record, and I would go to the mailroom and I'd give everybody a list and say, you guys are going to have a career. This is not something that I want you to do. This is something that you're going to do. And so I could start the work, and even if I left that, that group of men, they felt better about doing it because it made the president of men to do that work and how could they complain about, about the work. And so I developed this philosophy that not only do you lead by example, you lead the way for all of your team. It is your job to do that goal that you're going to ask somebody else to do and you're not prepared to do it yourself. If you do it, people will literally follow take care of that work. If they think you're having them do stuff that you would never do, you don't get them to do your stuff. Um, we have two ears and one mouth because God intended for us to listen more than we talk. If you're going to be a leader, you have to listen to what people have to say. It's not up to you to do the talking all the time, although that could be fun. <laughs> but you have to listen to the people that you want to lead. You cannot lead and be dumbed down. You have to understand what people's concerns are, what their fears are, what their desires are. And if you have that feedback and you listen to what the people in front of you say, you will be able to lead them. You can't lead people if you don't know what they're feeling about you and your leadership. So listen. Um, important thing to uh, to know about leaders. You gotta take care of your people. There's nobody I love like people. And there's nothing that you do that requires us to do the same thing. But you can view every opportunity as an opportunity to learn and to make a difference. Uh, one of the things I said a little while earlier, Tony came in and said, you know, I just really took a bag of bottles 
one vision spirit. And you just teach them the case study method. So there's your case study, your study of business and the problem they have, why they fail, and then you remain the options about what to do right, what to do wrong, and hopefully when you begin to run a business, you walk away from the best stuff. But I always have said to our generation, you never look at mistakes as a sign of failure. You look at mistakes as a learning experience, and you just say, rather than spending $75,000 in tuition, I just lost $50,000 that I know I'm taking back to my value team and my family. That's our biggest fear. Our fear is that no one can ask us for help. You know, a case study about something, or some of the things coming, or some of the options, or should be happy, but we do that with our own life. So, never think that you will fail if doing something that you are a failure. Just think that you just learned something, you're going to have to pay somebody else to learn it. Um, another tip that I've uh, given a few times today. So I'm just trying to give you one thing to do that for you. Um, people identify with success. Um, there's nothing like people being on the gold mine. So if you want to be a leader and you're aiming for things, you're trying to achieve things, what you do is you make sure that you pick something relatively easy that you can win at. Because then people will say, oh, you're a winner. I'm going to follow you. And so um, it's, it's a lot easier to get your three people together, start a connection. But once you start that connection, you have all the success, everybody gets on the ground running. When you first start the idea, people may be really skeptical. When I said, I think we need to have such and such in UCLA, Nobody thought it would happen. There were no black professors on campus. We had about 80 black students out of 30,000 students. You could go for days and not see any black people on campus. And so when I said, look, we can do this, people say, well, yeah, right. So when Freddie and I put together a class that became one of the more successful classes, we had about 700 students that were enrolled in the class. Now, all of a sudden, everybody wants their IEP to go to the Epic Summit Program. And so not only do we get all the black students engaged, we got the Spanish students engaged, we got the liberal faculty members engaged, everybody got on the bandwagon because we did something that was successful. So you do something that's successful, and you work carefully to make sure it's successful, it's a very basic organizing principle. If any of you have political science, you study Saul Alinsky and the way that he organized people in Chicago and stuff. The basic tenets of community organization is you start off and you do something successful. Uh, you got to get a stoplight on the street. You get the stoplight. You get the green. And you, what you've done is you convince people in the community that they have power, that they can make something happen. So, all right, we got the stoplight. Now let's get to the liquor store. We got the liquor store. Now we can let somebody buy. So, a classic example in this area of somebody who did that was Karen Bass. Karen Bass is a school teacher. She started an organization as one of the strongest organizations in Los Angeles, and they organized first to get a stop sign, then to get a liquor store, then to do things about housing. But you start by doing something where you have a victory. People will identify with success. When you're raising money, you know, if you want to be a leader and um, you own know, the vision and the power that you learn from it. Um, I think that in our world, um, the venture capital money and success is good at venture something that stands with someone in the social sector, very hard to get others to get it without there being a very close relationship. It can be hard even to get corporate success and stuff to do something that you think would work, but there are foundations and other things that you need to try and do something that's successful. So I hope that the other things that I've got here will probably lift up and say, boy, it was powerful. Because now you have demonstrated something that's good and moving forward. Now you have an opportunity as well to uh, leverage this for other things to learn about. So hopefully it's something pretty powerful that's out there for you. So what I'm doing, I'm going to try 
think in the Western Atlantic area, and we've got a very similar idea. Another principle that I've come to understand is very important for me as a leader to understand, and that simply is that most people will not give you money to do what you want. They'll give you money to do what they want. So your job as a leader is to convince people that what they want and what you are doing is one and the same. So, as a classic example, learned this from a man who's a vice chancellor of the Bruce Valley and Bruce College Life. And I remember sitting down with him, and he said, you know, when you're doing what you're doing, you have the budget of your day. And he told me a story about an NCIA agent who was trying to kill him. He said, you know, in order to do this, this business, you know, they shot me three times. And they shot me in the area of the ear, six of them were bad. So I went to the uh, CIA agent first. I said, now, I need your name. I know you work. I know you have a lot of credit in that area. I want to ask you for your name. I want to ask you to get my daughter's name for this film. And I need a name and credit for about $10 million. All I want you to do is to put this in the film and put it out there. Put it where there's money to be made. And so uh, I remember saying, okay, I can do that. To the people. And so he said they started going to meetings. They would go to one meeting. The guy would at first just listen and let Alan make the pitch. And of course, it would get away. And they would go to another meeting, and again, Alan would make the pitch, and it would get away. About the third meeting, John said, Well, let me make the pitch. These are my friends. So he made a pitch and got them all. This went on until he got to about the ninth person who said no, and walk, walking out of the meeting, John turned to Alan and said, you know what? The more we talk about this, the more I think it needs to be done. I'll make the new pitch. And so in trying to convince others, he convinced himself of the value of the project, and so he went ahead and made the pitch. So the lesson is that you want to get people if you're trying to raise money. You don't go and you don't say, this is for a worthy cause. These are poor kids who need scholarships. These are crack babies who are dying. You talk to people and you find out, what do they care about? Well, how do they want to change the world? What do they see that can make a difference? And when you find out from them what they're interested in, then you can say, you know what? I'm working on something that maybe fits what you're interested in. Let's talk about it. That's how you raise money. You don't raise money by asking people to give you for what you want. You ask them to give for what they want. And you let them know that you're the vehicle through which their dreams can be achieved with their money. That's your job as a leader when it comes to raising money. That's what you tell them. Um, and so... You can usually tell the people how effective the payment will be. Another thing that I've learned in being a leader is the value of having people around you that you may not agree with. Um, that's really what diversity is. Diversity isn't centering people and saying, you need a black person to come over and run around the game and you know, Asian Pacific Islander. Diversity is diversity of thought, experience, and worldview. You need to have people that are somewhere in your group, your leadership group, that are willing to tell you when you can have your say. Um, group think is the most dangerous thing that can exist in any enterprise. Because group think will prevent you from seeing the reality of what they're seeing. And so what good leaders have to learn to do is to have the central voices within their cabinet, within the 400 people you talk to, that make you be sure that your worldview and the, the, um, the things that you advocate for make sense. 
don't have diversity of thought, you run the risk of beginning to believe your own speculation to think you have a monopoly on truth when you don't have a monopoly on truth. If you're going to be an effective leader, it goes back to what I said earlier about the need to make sure you're talking to people, but make sure you're talking to people who have diverse views and have a diversity of thought because that will sharpen your views, it will sharpen your ideas, it will make you a more effective leader because you have considered care about people. Uh, we all know a great guy like that. And he said in time, and uh, time will show that he was one of the top August time off of the Walgreens, and Lincoln had spent all the money, and everybody was clapping and applauding, and he looked at the beer and he blows on it. Now, um, recently in 2008, the recession, a lot of businesses have lost a lot of business. And so one of the consulting companies that businesses use is Israel Business. They did a white paper. And what they found when they did the white paper is that those businesses who weathered the recession the best and were the most profitable were those organizations that had the most diverse views. Because they have money, they have people with international backgrounds, and when people are trying to figure out what are we going to do in the midst of this recession to make our businesses viable and so God just said, you know what you can do now? Those who had diverse goals were thinking the best in the recession than those who did not. Um, so there is a real value, and there's, a, there's quite a bit of literature that's been written about how diverse leaders are more effective and do better than others that tend not to be. Um, so, now, just a couple more points I want to make, and we're going to bring our band up. Um, Don't tell people what to think. You want to show them what to think. You want to be able to respect the people that you disagree with. You want to be willing to be, to listen and be humble. And you have to be willing to stand up and be the leader. You cannot lead from behind. You lead from in front. And if you Fear of being a leader, um, and it can be a situation like in class where the professor is going on and on, and you don't understand what the professor is saying. You raise your hand and say, um, Professor Zorn, I didn't quite get that. Can you explain that again? And what you will see is a bunch of heads go, Yeah, I didn't get that either. You know, I'm glad you asked the question. And probably all of us are doing that at school. The person who asks the question is usually the one that people are going to have the most fear of being a leader because they have the guts to stand up and say what others were thinking. They have the guts to take action that others would like to take the action, but they're afraid to be first. Leaders are usually first. First one to ask the question, the first one to say this is what we need to do, the first one to take a stand on principle, if you do that, you will separate yourself from the masses. And not only will you separate yourself from the masses, but you're more likely to get people who are willing to follow you because they like to learn. So you're not going to have the things that I talked about playing the play. You listen to people. You talk to people. You make sure that they understand that you may make a decision that they don't agree with but you at least give them an opportunity to be heard so they know that your decision is not a decision that was made precipitously, but it was a decision that was made after you received input from everyone that had something to say. So those are the principles 
and I try to to live my lifestyle as a leader uh, and over the the set of 40, 45 years that uh, I have been engaged in doing different things. I probably have started upwards of eight or nine different organizations that uh, I think are having an impact in the community we live in. And I mentioned the Coalition of Against Black Violence is another organization that, that I started some almost 20 years ago called Sharing Black Stories. Um, it's an organization that was started in part for Jerry's and immigrant Jerry's. Oftentimes, our experience with Jerry's in our story because we're not educated, or because they come from a country where you don't have government authority, uh, or they may be poorly educated or they're obscure. There's nothing that they can offer to the people. What we've done with that organization is we've actually taught poor parents um, and immigrant parents is the way I say they should act like upper class parents. Um, essentially, their kids should not even be in first grade, second grade, or third grade, or fourth grade, or fifth grade. And if those things aren't happening in the classroom, then you're getting a list of questions is that I've asked the teacher, is that I've asked the principal. Um, you tell them the things that they need to do in order to be an effective parent. Um, no matter how poor you are, what your circumstances may be, you can turn off the TV, you can turn off the TV, put on cable, and make sure that kids have a space to be parents of their own. Um, in fact, with, with parents who have children, I tell them it's important that you read to your child. Um, so we have a program we call Read to Reader. And even if you were to give people a book to read from Spanish, they start reading even as their kids are tiny. And so what we know is that poor people, their kids come to school with the vocabulary of just thousands of words less than middle class kids. So we have to figure out how do we change our story. So we have an organization that I work with to start that. Um, there's another organization that I've started. We call it the African American Girl Leadership Institute. We encourage women to have roles of listening on girls' house of boards, government commissions, and such. And so we have trained over 500 African American professionals and placed now almost 200 on different government boards and commissions. It's an organization I started in my own church. And I could go on and on. I keep rambling. But the, the fact of the matter is that there is a great need in our society now. And I think the need is for us to have public education for all. Why do we need public education again? Because if you go down the hill in some democratic society in a country that can read, Capitalism is a free market, and most women are educated, competent women. Or the notion is that I'm fortunate, so those folks who are not educated can get those facilities. But then you have two workers for every retiree. That's not the future we have. So what I would say to the to make a high school, and you can identify two students that you think are being educated well enough so that they will be able to graduate from high school, go to college, get a job, have a family, pay taxes to take care of poverty in Grand Street, and you want your child or your heir to be able to buy a house and raise their children and pay enough money on Social Security and Medicare so that you can retire, then you can have seizures. But if you go to the schools that I've been to, you're not going to find two students like that. And if you can't find two students like that today, what we know is that demographics are different. We know that if we do not produce children who can achieve at high levels, then we already know what the future of our country will be. It will 
Lord Jesus will save my people. If I do not have the educated work skill, do not have a sophisticated body, and if you do, I will stop. Nobody else will stop. If I can, I will stand up. And none of us stand up. And none of us can leave us. But unless we all collectively begin to realize that we have a crisis in our country that will manifest itself within a few years, then shame on us. So I always like to come and speak to groups because that's what is most important, isn't it? It's not about leadership. It's about the need that we have. Um, it's almost like a call to arms. But the need that we have to engage every citizen in this country, all of you that are part of the college community, if you don't get engaged in making sure the one institution that touches all of our kids works, then you are going to be, we will be collectively responsible for the collapse of our country. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us tonight. I actually want to work in educational policy, and I was hoping you could speak on the pros and cons of the government versus nonprofits as a group that defines it. So, um, we have a democratic form of government. It's very difficult for a democracy to make rapid change because the way the system works is you want to get in control of the elected. And the difference between here, let's say, in the University of California or Phoenix, is you never go to the subway. You can just decide to go to the subway, look out a window, and you start there. Here, that's not the case. So one of the reasons I feel that philanthropy could be beneficial for change is I think we have to look first to what the change is that we're most called on to do. And to make that to make that case, we have to have some concrete examples of what what can be done differently. So I think the first thing we gotta do is to demonstrate the change we want to see rather than just to advocate for change. So for example, we could say um, we think that there are opportunities we can act. We want folks to be able to work fairly. We think that we have a program that has strong mentorship. We have access to jobs and stuff we can do it in certain different ways. And you're not going to get a debate from Congress through that right away. So you've got to go to Congress. But if you want to have people get involved in the program and get out and make change, and on that basis, I think you ought to need some of the money that's in the subscription drives to programs that will work with people. So. So, so my view is that government can change, but it can only change if we have demonstrated the change that we want to take place. Um, and so that's, that's the way we ought to look at it, rather than doing it the same process. In your ending statement, you alluded to mentorship. How important is a mentor to young people trying to uh, get a job? It is essential. And, and what do I mean by that? I think that, especially for kids who have come from maybe a deprived background, they need to see success. They need to see what is, what does it look like? What, what is, it, is it for me? Um, and without having seen it, it's hard to be it. 
But what Richard will provide is the kind of feedback that a lot of times young people don't have from somebody who's a role model that they can see up there. You went to college and you have a career and you have a job and you're telling me some things that I need to do. That is that is very helpful. It is a it's a program uh, that is where we work with youth center students. Kids who are twelve to um, who are twelve to like twenty who have extended um, and what you find is that in so many cases the trauma that our young people are going through is something that a lot of us cannot imagine. And so one of the things that a mentor can do is it can begin to bring out on a young person, not all at once, but can develop a relationship and to bring out of them that trauma that oftentimes is an impediment to their learning, it's becoming an impediment to them engaging in socially appropriate behavior. And so what we found, uh, the government just started in Los Angeles one of the excellent programs and what they do is they start off with 22 youth center Sundays, and for the first month or so, they just talk about the trauma in their life. And what these kids can do is they feel comfortable enough to reveal uh, about their life that they might not know. Ray Gilliland, many of these young men have been with us, and he revealed something about his mother that nobody at this university knew. But when you have a mentor who talks to people and asks questions of them, you begin to draw out of them a lot of the demons that sometimes are in their mind. And that's step one to the recovery of making and being a whole human being that has the ability to love and help the people. So mentors are very important. So, um, did you have any other questions? Okay, you heard me talk about um, starting school at, at uh, K-12. That lies towards the responsibility of, of colleges and, and universities. Um, and uh, I think, because I consider myself as a social activist, that the, the role of colleges and universities really is doing research that matters to making society better. It's not really doing the research for research sake, but I think it ought to be research that's going to have an impact. Um, because the reasons that, that we support institutions of higher learning is to help advance our civilization itself. And that to me means that you're learning things and you're studying things that what you learn what you study, that you then make that available for the body politic to make it better. Um, it does not help you uh, as a teacher. And uh, the way I think about it is if we were in a state of nature, um, we would want our elders to teach us how to hunt. We want to know what herbs we could use for medicine. We want to learn some things about how we would protect ourselves in the environment that we live in. And as we have progressed as a people, um, what we've done is we become more specialized as a civilization. And within that specialization, the educational institutions have the responsibility in the first instance to teach our young how to survive, how to read. They have basic skills in order to survive. And then those specialty institutions, universities and colleges, we set them aside to even spend more of their brain power to figure out what are the things that we can do to help advance our society even further. And to me, that, that, that's the rationale for the existence. I don't believe that we should just have an ivory tower of people sitting around saying, you know, consciously we're helping each other, but also we're helping our society so that we help other people.
mess up. They're not coming to Jesus in this way. Or you burn them for our cause and on top of the earth. The reason Father says it's this is because they are so in our way that have failed for 50 years. Same sin. Nothing's ever happened to them. The federal legislation provides that if you open a charter school, you get a charter for up to five years. If the schools don't perform, the charter is revoked. So you have absolute accountability for the charter. The reason you, you've heard what they revoke, and, and it upsets me to no end, because we hear about, you know, foster, you know, not kids, and that the BLs are trying to take over the school system. That's not how charter schools work. They're all pretty much the same. As a charter school, the money that comes from the state follows the child. It's barely enough money to educate kids. So that um, this notion that public education is being robbed by charter schools, it fails to focus on the kids. There's a reason that parents are sending their kids to charter schools. Um, what, one, of, one of the early lessons I had when I was still working in the school segregation field, there are a lot of no no's that we have in life. You know, no to vouchers, no to charter schools. And the first birthday party my, my daughter, my other daughter went to, when she was in first grade, she went to a birthday party for her brother when the class was about this tall. Um, and she lived in East LA. And so I went to the party and said, I want to say there are a couple of things that made me uncomfortable. The first thing was, I've never seen so many kids in a bus, ever, or out playing. And at the end of the block, there was an elementary school. So I went upstairs to the apartment where the little girl where the party was. He had a big father and his three sons and all that. And I got in conversation with, with the little girl's mother. She was an immigrant from El Salvador. She had come down here. And I asked her, because the little girl was getting ready to have her sixth birthday. I said, why are you taking the little girl on the bus? Uh, our kids are going to a magnet school in Brentwood. She, took, she left in the dark at 5 in the morning for a bus ride all the way across L.A. to go to a school where there was nobody in the community. She got back from the bus at the end of the day, took a two-and-a-half-hour ride home. So she left in the dark, and she got home in the dark. And I said, why would you do that? She said, well, we know that all the first-grade teachers are going to come down this bus to tell you. And there's nothing we can do. Everybody in the community says, Send your kids anywhere else but there because they're going to be miseducated. So she said, so that's why I have my little girl on the bus. I want her to get a decent education. 